Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Jared Veld Beer Show. Today, I got John Wakefield. One, two, one, two, three, go! Hey, 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 fill it up, fill it up, hey, 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 fill it up, fill it up, hey, 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 fill it up, fill it up, hey, hey, hey. Mike Hunter of Jay Wakefield Brewing in Miami, Florida. John, what's up, man? What's going on? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. How is it uh, in South Florida right now? What is it about 90, a lot of humidity? Yeah, it's about uh, 95 degrees and about 100% humidity. Nice. And we're about <laughs> to get some wicked storms that are rolling through here. Uh, it's like the first time I've ever got a notification from Weatherbug that said dangerous thunderstorms. Like Usually it's just a thunderstorm watch or a thunderstorm warning, but I got the old dangerous thunderstorm alert, so... We'll see what's happening. If you hear thunder in the background, it's all right. Oh, yeah. Well, we normally get uh, the flood warning. That's what I get <laughs> from too much rain. So, so, so John, I feel you on that one. Yeah, man. It, I know you're making some killer beer down there in South Florida, but what got what got you into craft beer in the first place? Man, it was actually a hobby. I was, after playing college football, I went to post-grad, got my post-grad degree in accounting. I did accounting for 15 years and kind of towards the end of that, probably the last seven years, started back in like 04. I got into craft beer, drinking it, trading it, and uh, figured I could be doing it myself. I started homebrewing. You know, the uh, started with a Mr. Beer kit, and that didn't last very long because a gallon of beer wasn't enough for everybody. And uh, graduated to uh, a five-gallon brew system, and it kind of, kind of went from there. What was it like uh, being part of the beer trade? What was how? How did you like that? I know, I know that's a whole little <laughs> underground uh, society that, especially in the early days of craft beer, was like just roaring. Well, what were you trying to get? Um, like, what what were you trying to get your hands on? Oh my gosh. I mean, back then living in Miami, we didn't really have the, I mean, really, honestly, there were no options. I think we had one craft beer bar in Miami that is no longer here. We had no total wines. We had no real, like none of the liquor stores or anything were carrying any craft beer. I think uh, we had just started to see some of the Belgian stuff come in West Flateren, St. Bernardus, stuff like that. But like, any of the other stuff I had to like order directly from California, New York, like these select shops I had to buy from just to get craft beer in my hands to drink. It lasted that way for probably about four years. And then come 2009, that's when Cigar City came into fruition. And we actually had a craft brewery in Florida that was worth some salt. I, they were really the first ones to really start everything. I mean, they started a lot of things in the whole craft beer industry, especially like adjunct stouts. I mean, they were the first ones to do it. Trading actually worked in my favor then because people were dying to get their hands on Cigar City. So it made it much easier for me to get my hands on Lost Abbey, uh, Russian River, like Pliny the Younger, any of the, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments, Red Poppy, Veritas, Dark Lord. Like, that's the kind of stuff we were trading for back then. Nice. So, I mean, that's that's what it was. Yeah, some some big names that you're throwing around there, and uh, yeah, <laughs> some, some good beers though. I mean, some really good. Oh beers. yeah. And then it seems like uh, like all those beers now. There's a lot of craft breweries that are trying to you know emulate the OGs. You know, we're kind of doing. Um, and so is that like one of the reasons that you know led you to to opening up your own place in in Miami? Uh, just the fact that you know craft beer in florida in south florida as a whole was just such a for a better word it was just you know kind of lacking behind the, a, the rest of the, it was a desert yeah we were a desert i mean basically we were a beer desert we did not you know there were no options so i figured you know why not try to brew some beer myself that i would enjoy drinking and that's where it kind of took place and that's where it you know it kind of launched from was drinking beers that i wanted to drink that i didn't have to trade for you know i could just brew it put it on draft at my house and enjoy these beers without having to shell out a ton of money and or trade value to try to square some of this stuff away so i can enjoy one or two of these beers you know in such small quantity yeah no doubt and uh you know it's it's worked out well for you so so good good job doing that uh <laughs> What are you the most proud of at, at Jay Wakefield? Like uh, wh when you look at the brewery, it could be a beer. It could just be a process. Like what do you take the most pride in? I, I think it's 
what we started with and what kind of what I kind of became known for when I was home brewing, and that was really the fruited sours. Obviously, not the version of what some of them are today in the slushy sours or uh, smoothie sours, but like fruited Berliners didn't exist back in 2009. And I did a lot of homework. I love to hit the books. <laughs> Sounds nerdy, but it, it it's what I you know it's what I enjoy doing. And I really dove into like the history of beer, like the styles of beer that no one really cared for, didn't exist anymore. And why? Because they were relevant at some point. Why not, you know, why not try to bring them back and see how people would respond to them now? And that's how I came up with bringing back like the Berliner Weiss. Nobody was brewing the Berliner Weiss up until about 2013, 2014. But I started brewing it at home and taking it to Cigar City for some of their events. Uh, they had me brew two pilot batches on their pilot system there. We put it on for Hunapu Day and Fruit in the Room, and it really kind of launched that whole style. But the idea was, you know, back in the day in Germany, you had a tart, acidic, sour ale with no fruit in it. And it was more of like a summertime drink for women because they would get the beer in a glass, like a goblet glass, and then add sweet, you know, fruited syrups, raspberry, woodruff whatever they had at the time into the glass and stir it up and drink it that way to kind of balance out the acidity. And I just kind of flipped it all on its head and added the fruit and fermentation and just changed the whole process. And it's what, it's what really helped launch our brewery was that brand, that style. I feel like that style fits really well in South Florida. I mean, you got the, the hot, hot, humid temperatures. It's a refreshing beer. It's kind of a, it's, it's a no brainer. I'm sure that fit really well and kind of won a lot of people over. It did. I mean, the first iteration were very low alcohol. When we first started, all of our sours were three and a half percent alcohol, you know, heavily fruited. It was a good play on, you know, sweet and tart, sweet and sour. But, you know, as we, as they've morphed over time, people were like, these beers are too light, too light, too light. They need to have a little more alcohol content. So, I think we shifted that in like 2017, we started making them 6%. So now every variation of those is 6% alcohol, more fruit, but, you know, a little more punch on the acidity as well. So it, it's still kind of in the same realm as what it started, but, you know, I'm still very proud of what those sours that we turn out. And are, is that still, you know, one of your favorite styles to brew or, has it you know still has a special place in your heart, but you like to you know do some other stuff now. As we sit here today, like what's your favorite beer to brew? Uh, it would still be stouts. I I've always been even since day one. I mean, I had my time when I was drinking craft beer and stuff. I mean, for many years, just pounding IPAs, and I kind of worked myself right out of that by drinking too many IPAs. <laughs> but I, I've always been from, I guess it was inherited from my father. He's a dark beer guy, porters and stouts. So am I. And I, I really enjoy brewing stouts. I mean, that's probably my favorite style to brew. And do you like sticking with like the classic Irish dry stout? Or do you like the imperial stout where you can throw all sorts of fun stuff in it? Or do you go like the pastry stout route? Or do you like to do it all? A little bit of both. We actually, when we first opened the doors, we had a, a basically a smoked porter. It was only 7% alcohol, smoked porter, not heavily smoked. It was light on the Roush malt and the beer is great. I mean, we brew it once a year now because as we saw down here and in a lot of different like venues or, you know, across the country, like Porter is kind of in that weird zone that it's like not a brown ale and it's not an imperial stout. So not a lot of people gravitate towards Porters. So it is like it found a like a dead zone. And we basically had to work it out of the lineup because it just wasn't selling. But the beer was great. It's just people weren't drinking them. So I, I love that, you know, brewing that 7% Porter all the way to the big barrel-aged stouts that we do with adjuncts or just straight-up barrel-aged stout. That whole kind of gamut, I that's still my wheelhouse. Yeah, what's it like trying to source, like, the barrels for your beer? Do you uh, work with, like, a provider, or do you try to hunt down different stuff? Oh. How does that whole process go? It's changed over the years. When we first opened in 2015, I think there was one barrel house for, like, the whole country, or maybe two. And 
prices on barrels were like through the roof and it was impossible to find barrels because at the time Japan and Scotland were taking all the bourbon barrels for secondary aging for all the whiskey. So it was almost impossible to source bourbon barrels at that time. But then we kind of fell into that bourbon boom. Now there's thousands of, of spent barrels you can get your hands on. So it's easier for us now to actually get barrels and there's 10 different barrel houses, barrel brokers, that we have to buy since no one, I mean, we don't have any distilleries really in Florida. So we always have to source our barrels from outside. And it's typically through Kentucky bourbon barrel or river drive, or there's Rocky mountain barrel company or Midwest barrel. I mean, there's so many, so many choices now, but it's much easier nowadays to source barrels. What's the funkiest barrel that you've ever aged a beer in? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I I knew these guys at Makuni Wild Harvest. It's a company out of Vancouver that they do very select, like specific items, like high end items for restaurants. Like back in the day, it was finger limes, and they would go out and source um, U.S. grown like wasabi root and, and then licorice root and all this stuff specific. But they were making, they were probably one of the first guys to be making like bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. They were the first ones to do. This. This. They would then turn that barrel and put sherry vinegar in it and age the sherry vinegar in the spent maple bourbon barrel and take that sherry vinegar out. Well, for, you know, for all intents and purposes, I was like, you know, just send me one of those barrels and let's see what happens. <laughs> and we actually took, I think, I think it was a, it was a sour ale base that we had cherries in and we put it in this five gallon sherry maple bourbon sherry vinegar maple bourbon barrel and that was probably like people it came out some people loved it people some people hated it some people were like why would you age it in vinegar barrels and it's like well we wanted to try something out you know yeah and so it wasn't a fan favorite i mean not everybody hated it it wasn't that bad but that was probably the funkiest barrel we've ever aged something in yeah sounds sounds a little polarizing like uh yes. just yeah it's like uh we're not gonna <laughs> Like a little leery on even putting the description out there on what it was aged in, because <laughs> as soon as you throw <laughs> sherry vinegar uh, oh, in any kind of description, no, I... it's people are gonna uh, start tasting with their ears first, probably. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. One guy walked in and, and was like, ah, oh, this is, this is acetic. This is you, you have acetobacter in your beer. And we're like, no dude, we aged it in a vinegar barrel. There's acetobacter in the vinegar already. So it's there. Like we didn't like the beer didn't go bad. It actually aged in a vinegar barrel. Yeah. <laughs> so. But Hey, but thanks for letting us know that that's <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh man. So but it, outside, yeah. like starting up your, your, your brewery, Outside of, you know, the, the capital, the money, all that stuff, what was the toughest thing that you've had to work through? You know, it could be something that was, you know, your first year getting off the ground. It could be something now. Just what's oh. what's what's the biggest chunk of adversity that you've had to get through? It was, I mean, besides raising the capital, uh, which we did a crowdfunding campaign, which everybody thinks the crowd can, the crowdfunding campaign paid for everything, but it only paid for about 10% of it. <laughs> so we had to source the rest of the capital. It was probably really, because I had worked in commercial brewing, I worked for Cigar City. And I did a small stint at Stone, but it was really me, another guy I had brought on in Maria, working in the back and really trying to understand and run this 15 barrel brew house, you know, from the ground up, you know, by ourselves and trying to constantly, like consistently brew decent to good beers and learn as we're going. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that was probably the biggest challenge. Yeah. How long did it take you to kind of lock in that system? Oh. Jeez. Um, probably about a year. You know what I mean? Just, just everything because I had, it was also a man. It's still a manual system. It's what I worked on when I was at Cigar City. So there's no rakes. It's all manpower. You're turning the mash, all manpower. It's a great workout. I, if anybody wants <laughs> a real workout, you know, I come and turn an Imperial stout grist on, on this 15 barrel manual system and, and you'll know, you know, I'm in, it's I'm worse in. than That's... hitting the sleds all day. I, th I think I'm in for it, man. I'm, I'm in for that challenge. Yeah. Yeah. When, yeah. When, when it was, it's that, like going to the weight room. I mean, but, but much more updated. <laughs> yeah. Do you, and do you like it that way though? Do you like having that hands-on control over the system opposed to something that's automated? I mean, I do. I mean, obviously I'm not spinning the deck anymore. I mean, 
it took a toll on me. I mean, I was up there every single day of my life, you know, for about a year and a half. It, it's a work, but I enjoy the ability to have a more hands-on process and dialing in a beer that way. I, I think it's, for us, I think it's better results. Do you think, you feel like once you had that system totally dialed in, like your repeatability was on point, you knew how to handle the variables there was yeah. no more wild cards, that kind of thing. No, till till we started, you know, there's always teaching process and the break-in process for a new brewer. And that's always kind of a wild card when you bring somebody in that might have been on an automatic system. Now you have to get them used to an, a manual system. And it's always just that kind of shift, that kind of learning curve for these guys. That's always a variability, but I mean, it, it tends out, you know, you kind of work that out pretty fast because Maria was always there coaching or I'm there coaching these guys. So it, it works out pretty fast because we still oversee it till we feel comfortable that they're ready to kind of take over the reins by themselves without any oversight. So how many, how many people do you now have, uh, you know, working for you guys on, in the brew house? Uh, five. So we got, actually, we have a head brewer now. Maria is still our head brewer. And then we have a lead brewer and then we have a brewer's assistant. And then I've got basically rotates between yeah three to four guys working the cellar canning line and stuff like that in the back. And so, I mean, how important is it building that team uh, and, oh my and just gosh. Making, making sure it's just, you know, that's, that's your starting lineup. Like that's, you need them to oh, perform. Yeah. Like how, how do you make sure that everybody's on their a game? Because not everybody <laughs> is the owner of the brewery, you know, it's uh no, absolutely. And, 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 I mean... and you want people to take ownership in it. And, you know, I get it. Like, even if it's not their brewery, it's still, you know, that the beer is a reflection of whatever team is back there, but how do you get everybody firing on all cylinders all the time? When it's at this point and you're no longer, or you're no longer, you know, you have retired from the playing field, you have to turn and morph into basically a coach. It's through that coaching and that leadership ability that find the right pegs that fit the right holes. I mean, we've been through a lot of iterations over seven years. Not all members of the team worked out great. There were some weak links. You know, we had to keep searching and searching and you kind of rotate through players. You know, people move on to new teams or, you know, new breweries and it's constantly trying to find those players that fit best into that, that rotation to give you a solid lineup. It's... It's not easy. It's definitely now at this point for me, it's more of, of a coaching aspect and kind of like an oversight, like like an offensive coordinator. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you're saying. And for anybody listening who didn't know, John played uh, college football. Was it Robert Morris? Yeah. Ro yeah. At Robert Morris, he was a fellow offensive lineman. So yes. uh, a yeah. lot of love for that. And I can see the former O lineman working through, how do I – how do I get yes. everybody on the same page here? Cause it's important. <laughs> if you're not all on the same yeah. page, someone blows an assignment, the whole thing's blown yeah. up. Yeah. I mean, what do you think like taking that former college football offensive line mindset, do you think that's paid off for you? You know, being a, being a brewer? Cause I'm, I don't know any other guys running breweries that were collegiate offensive linemen. No, I, I don't either. I mean, it's a different mindset than a quarterback. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's um, I do because you know, when you, when, you know, as you, as you know, you played NFL beyond what I did, but like, even as, as an offensive lineman, you have to work cohesively as a team. If one member of the five fails, you all fail. So you all have to be on the same page, not missing assignments, all working together. It's the same thing in the brewery. You know, the brewers have to be doing what they need to be doing on their assignments in cohesion with the guys in the back, having the tanks prepped, having, you know, everything ready for these guys. And then, it just kind of flows down the line. If if one piece is off or somebody's off that day, then yeah, it, it could screw a lot of things up. Off, no, it's hard, man. Off days are no good. They're they're not allowed. So where do you think craft beer's heading? Like within the next ten years, and how are you guys, you know, trying to you know adapt with you know the the ever changing landscape? I th I mean, it's definitely changed. I mean, from when we started in 2015. I mean, I can always go back and, and visualize back in 2015. The first year we went out to GABF out in Denver, I think there was 1,800 breweries in the country. <clears throat> and then we watched over the next three, four years, that number just like explode. And I think we had almost 8,000 breweries within like three, three and a half years time. I think it's definitely slowed down. I think, you know, that growth that we had is kind of done, but I think that was also part of the hands of obviously the pandemic, but it, cha it changed everything. You know, we used to have lines so we would do releases and people would line down the block and we'd have, we'd be 600 deep 
on a on a line waiting to pick up bottles. It's all basically like today we just signed up for for Osner, which is a online platform where you can buy the beers now online and have first direct access to it. Like it, the whole game has changed. I think a lot of it. I think the days of waiting in line for beer is probably pretty much over. I think everybody wants quick, instant access, and it's going to be done through the internet now. I think beers changed as far as the styles of beers. That people want, you know, seven years ago, we had lightly fruited sours and we had minimalistic adjunct stouts, you know, where I think the most adjuncts we had put in a stout was coffee, coconut and vanilla, but it was still on the lighter side. Now you have these full on pastry stouts that are just loaded to the gills with adjuncts and and fruited sours that are, I mean, pretty much smoothies. I mean, everybody tries to say that the lagers are coming back. I don't know. I think everybody enjoys a great lager, but I think that that idea that people had like a year and a half ago, two years ago, that lagers were going to make this big comeback, it never happened. I mean, I think it, we've seen a rise in craft lagers, but it wasn't going to like trump and take the day over everything else. Obviously, it, we still ha we still have hazy IPAs as well. It seems like, yeah, for lagers to like, take off and you know take over that market share as being like a dominant beer in the craft beer industry they'd have to be a lot yeah they just seem like they're just so much more high maintenance for for, oh, yeah. for brewer i mean they just take up they eat into the tank space as far as you know the aging process and you know they're they're so much more delicate it just seems like a diva in the brew house would get old after a while and if it's if that's the case then how is it going to take over as, as a huge fad right well, no, it's you're absolutely right because when you speak upon, you know, ales versus lagers, people can crank out ales in anywhere from as short as seven days up to like three weeks. Whereas a lager is going to eat up tank time for at minimum a month to two months. So you're also looking at revenue, you know, where you could have a beer in a tank. And if it's going to take you eight, eight weeks versus within that eight week period, you could turn out eight beers or eight ales, you know. What's going to make you more money? It was the same thing with us. We really didn't start making loggers till into 2019, but I had purchased five new tanks and we had the viability to lay one of those tanks away just for logger production. And that was okay with me because it's something I wanted to get into. And that tank is solely dedicated for loggers. So now we're cranking out 17 to 20 loggers a year. And what's your go-to lager style that you guys are usually uh, going with? It's, we actually, we always rotate it too. We never keep it the same. So we either have a German pills, Japanese rice lager, a Mexican lager, or, you know, just a good old American light lager. And they all work. Everybody drinks the crap out of them. I mean, it's so hot down here. So people yeah. come in that <laughs> aren't really, say. you know, that, that they don't want sours. They don't want stouts. They don't want IPAs. So you have to have that kind of option for people to drink. And it's, it's a lager. No, I mean, and, and I'm not trying to talk smack on any lager. I love a good lager. Like it's a, right. it's, a it's a great beer to think that it was going to take over the craft beer scene was, no. was no. A, you know, and, uh, it was a hot take, hot take for sure. Well, well, that was, that was more of a, an idea or wish from brewers <laughs> you know? yeah, like oh, it was almost like a romantic idea like right it, that was an idea from brewers especially at beer fest because when you go to beer fest and you're hanging out with all the the brewers you know we're not drinking ipas and stouts you know because we're not 22 years old you know we're all drinking lagers because we can have five six seven lagers and be okay you know what i mean and, and be all right so we're all drinking lagers and everybody's like man yeah wait wait till the craft lager scene takes over you know, it's a, it just never happened. What do you think so. is like one of the biggest lies in craft beer? Like just something that's, you know, accepted as a truth all over the industry, but you just don't agree with at all. I would say the masquerading of the macro brands that have had, that have plugged in these breweries that are so-called craft when they're really not, and, I can give you an example. Yeah. I can give you an, ex give you an example by that. I am in the Wynwood district in Miami. I am surrounded by four other breweries and they're all owned by macro brands and we are the only independent brewery left i think the days of like anheuser buying up other breweries is kind of done but two breweries owned by anheuser bush one that was bought out but another one that was 100 percent built ground up by anheuser going hey we're craft beer not really and then we had uh, heineken come in and build uh, another brewery about a block and a half away and it's the beers are eh, but it's it's just it's Heineken masquerading as a craft brewery. Yeah, 
And and if it's, you're not super plugged into the the craft beer, no, you know, industry, <laughs> it, it would be that's kind of like to me it's like one of the things like you go to your beer store you go to your liquor store and you walk into the the giant beer cooler and there's like just hundreds of beers there well great there's all this beer to choose from but what's to say that any of this beer is good beer well right there's there's really no indicator and the the, con, the normal consumer that's not really a craft beer aficionado they don't know any different you know till they walk into the brewery and they're like oh yeah you know hey we went over here and this and that and they're like well yeah that's really an anheuser-busch brewery and they're like oh i had no idea you know they're like oh your beers are better but i'm like it, it's it's just a difference in care and it's it was them interjecting these breweries just to make money it was you know? almost like that yeah, was it was like, spe- like speculation during the craft beer boom really like when when yeah. all those breweries were taken off and it's like you saw it with like ballast point got bought out like just when you saw all those big buyouts it was almost like anheuser-busch just sitting there you know trying to make sure that they still had market share within the booming industry of, of craft beer of course absolutely that's what it exactly was i mean because budweiser or anheuser had been operating in the red for a very very long time and they were trying to gobble back up you know, market share. And that's what the move was all about. I think so. they, they certainly bought up a bunch. And then, yeah, like we said, people really don't, people don't know that. Um, no. But, you know, it is what it is. It's still good to see, you know, craft beer, you know, solidifying itself, even, you know, with some breweries having to, you know, close doors with the pandemic and everything, you know, we're still, you know, sitting at a, a nice national quota of, of, of craft breweries, which is, which is great. Like, you know, I'd rather, even if, even if there's a brewery like that and I'm visiting a town and there's a place to go out and be social, it's, you know, it's, right. it's, it's still, it's still a good time. Uh, no, it's still, I mean, it's definitely helpful. You know what I mean? In ways, instead of having one brewery here, we got five, you know, so it helps. Yeah. It's going to drive, it's going to get the beer yeah. people into your neighborhood. And that's, I mean, that's yeah. synergy, no matter how you slice it, no matter who it is, Absolutely. it's just, it's the more, more people looking for beer in a neighborhood, they're going to stumble onto onto your spot you know and that's not a bad thing so first of all i can't wait to get down to your spot uh we were, we were talking before you know I've, I've i'm friends with some brewers and you know everyone has, has sung your praises and so i look forward to a tasting your beer b checking out your spot and uh and c turning turning that mash ton uh, yeah, we, we talk about a collab beer when you come down because I know you already brewed one with the Arizona Wilderness Boys. So yeah, those those, those are my guys out there. What yeah. what are you guys doing with uh, with the hoppy stuff these days? Uh, you know, where do you see uh, the current state of IPA and and what are you trying to do with it? I mean, I think we're still in that flux of Northeast style. I mean, when we started, we are even our I mean, even till today, our house IPA is a west coast style ipa it's it's a good mashup old east coast style ipa with west coast style so it's not overly bitter i think it's only 65 ibus it's approachable like our house ipa is approachable by men and women you know i mean because that super bitter west coast bomb which there's nothing wrong with those because they used to drink the crap out of them it was definitely a market shift five years ago when when everybody went northeast style and if you're not making a Northeast style IPA now on the East coast, you're, you know, no one even looks at you. If I thought maybe, uh, maybe one day we'll shift back to where it's just all clear, you know, <laughs> all clear IPAs and stuff. I don't know. I don't know if that's the way it's going to go. It might eventually, I mean, you know, history always repeats itself. I think we might get back to the point where people enjoy more of a clean, crisp, clear, bitter IPA. Yeah, and it's almost like a, it's like an apples to oranges thing, really, because they're almost like completely different beers. I mean, oh, it's just di- different hop expression, and to yep. me, they're they're different. Like they scratch different itches. Like, yep. if if I want that classic West Coast, like I'm going for like a Torpedo or just Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. You know, they those always hit the spot for me, and they're easy to find. And because you can't you can't really go to your neighborhood brewery anymore and, and find that kind of West Coast IPA. Maybe sometimes you can, but usually it's, you know, it's all New England style hazies. And I love those yeah. too. I think those are really good. In fact, like what I'm, the yeast that I've been using, you know, in my brewery downstairs is, you know, one of the London derivatives. And I really like, you know, how that plays around with my go-to galaxy hop that that I'm a, I'm a big fan of. And that's kind of what, that, that's what led me to ask you the question about the, the state of IPA. Just we brew a beer, man. I, I It would be hard not to make it a hop forward beer because I'm I think at my core, oh, I'm, I'm I mean, still still a hop head. You know, it's just there's so many uh, you know new hop varieties that are always you know 
right around the corner. So going back to that relevancy thing, it's like the IPA just keeps reinventing itself through all these new hot breeding programs. And now you got like the yeast companies that are modifying the yeast. So you get different hop expression out of the beer. And yep. Yep. There's, there's some cool science stuff going into the IPA these days. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely keeps sounding dated, but you know, like seven years ago, it was Citra. That was the hop to use and, you know, and you still had Amarillo and Simcoe and Columbus and uh, Chinook, and you had these other older varieties. And then you had, if you could get your hands on it, you had Galaxy and Nelson. But now, I mean, there's so many to choose from and it's almost hard to, you know what I mean? It's almost yeah. hard to keep up because there's just so many varieties. And then like you said, all of, all of a sudden, you know, now you have all these different yeast companies that have played around with the yeast and taken the best properties out of the different strains that they've had and they've built these specific strains to kind of do specific things for these hot forward beers. So it's constantly changing and it's, you know, constantly evolving. And to me, it's always a chase like, Hey, what's the new hop? Like, what do we got to go after this year? Like, what do we got to get on contract? You know, or somebody will put a beer out and like, Oh, that's a new hop. So then you got to go and try to find it. So it's constantly <laughs> you're chasing, you know what I mean? Yeah, no doubt. What are you guys playing around with right now? Like, what's uh, what's the hot hop in the brewery? Oh, my gosh. Um, I think we just picked up contract for my buddy at EQ Brewery was Motueka is coming back hard. Played around with Strata. Oh, yeah. Pacific Jade. Definitely. I mean, we do a ton of Galaxy stuff now. Nelson. I love Hallertau Blanc. And then we get, we had these varieties from, I think it was Hopsteiner was Trident and then Sultana, uh, which I think is a rebranding of uh denali but it's dude it's it's constantly hard to keep up with i mean we're constantly like trying to look at sheets and like hey you know this is experimental zero three two eight five and like <laughs> this is what here do you want some of this you know and it's like ah uh, you don't know and if you might miss the boat and then you're kind of hustling back to, to try to get some yeah do you guys like try to balance that out a little bit like with the unknown new stuff and keeping like the og hops in place and and just so well, there's, you're, there's yeah i mean your og hops are right now i mean that are the heavy hitters or galaxy citra nelson when you can get your hands on it really those three are the big heavy hitters and then like everything else around it plays great parts into it you know and then you start blending hops to achieve the flavor profiles that you want in that ipa you know, if you're looking for tropical or do you want a bit of dank and grassy and or do you want pine and citrus? Like, I mean, you, you really have to kind of lay down. It's almost like <clears throat> formulating like a dinner, you know what I mean? And yeah. like a dinner pairing and like what works best with these, you know, together. So it's it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Just like you boil it all down. Like what's what's your favorite hop? Like if you were just to do a, a single hot beer. And just you're drinking it. You're not brewing it for anybody else but yourself. What do you, what do you, uh, what hop are you using? I'm still going to Citra. I don't think that thing is, I don't think Citra is going anywhere. For me, it still holds a great flavor profile. You know, just everything that it does for a hoppy beer still, for me, is part of none, you know, it, the best in my book. Yeah, I think Citra is like one of the hops that got me into IPAs because I, you know, started yep. like a lot of the other people. And, you know, first time you have an IPA, you're like, what is it? Like, how are people drinking this? This is crazy like this. And then all of a sudden you have a couple more and then you stumble upon that one that kind of opens all the doors up. And I, and I think right. that was uh, Zombie Dust from Three Floyds, which is yes. which is all yep. Citra. And, uh, yep. and so that got me going. So I, I respect the Citra pick for sure. That and I mean, Galaxy is great too. I mean, I really fell in love with, with Strata and what it was doing for beers. Yeah, Strata is great. But the then, the aromas know. of Strata, like it's like that perfect, like gives you just enough like dankiness without like yep. being overly like weedy and resonant. Like you get some really good fruit out <laughs> yeah, of it still. Exactly. It's, and it pairs yeah. really, and it pairs super nice with Galaxy too. But uh, yep. Galaxy, I think Galaxy is sure like, Galaxy is probably my favorite. That's, I got a 100% Galaxy beer that's just kegged today actually that putting, oh, in the nice. local, putting in the local homebrew competition in a couple of weeks so see how that one plays nice. out okay. that's, yeah that's that's my favorite so we'll uh we'll see how it shapes up but uh kind of rounding this thing out you got uh you got one beer to pick it's that desert island question i like to i like to phrase it as in the form of the apocalypse it's your last night on earth you can't pick your own beer you can only take one beer with you this night you can drink as many of it as you want what beer are you choosing? Oh, wow. That, I mean, that's always a tough question for me. I think I'm, 
one beer. Now I'm having to think hard on this one. <laughs> <laughs> you said not my own beer. So yeah, um, can't be your own. Boy, for me, it would probably it would probably be. I would say if I could like probably a lost Abbey barrel aged stout, I'm going to say, I'm going to say probably barrel aged like serpent stout since like you can't really like nail down a Veritas because it constantly changes. What was the oatmeal raisin? That was track six though. Out of the, yeah. I mean, if they, if I could have one beer and it was out of their track set that they did, it was number six and it was like a bourbon barrel aged oatmeal raisin cookie stout. That beer, I, I could be happy with that for, a long time perfect and then hey the best part about it is too you don't have to worry about repercussions for the morning because it's the end of times you know you can, <laughs> you can kick as many of those back as you want uh what draws exactly. you to that beer Mel? like what's what's the uh, overall like flavor profile that does it for you on that one i i think it's a combination of the you know of the barrel of that that coconut like you get the coconut and the vanilla flavor profile coming off the oak in that bourbon and then really it was the combination of the spices with that that raisin like almost oatmeal characteristic like that it just reminds me i love oatmeal raisin cookies so for me that was like a home run have not got yeah. to try that one but it sounds it sounds good sounds like it's yeah i think they the brought it they, they brought it back i mean they did so they did it came in like you it was a brewery only release it was like this old school deal where it came in like those those like record trunks like back in the days, like you would like haul around all your vinyl and like these these like square trunks with like the closing locks. And they put 13 different beers, like I think there were 375 milliliter beers, 13 of them. And then on top was a vinyl record with all of the art done by the original artists that did all the labels for every single bottle. That's I mean, sweet. it was dope. Yeah, I feel like like I actually go ahead. Like, those, like those big badass imperial styles. Like you need some, you need some awesome art. Like you can't skip yeah. on the art for for the imperial style. It just doesn't do it justice. Like especially you got and all I, that and going I, into the beer. Yeah, and I still have that trunk. I actually drugged that trunk around Europe, picking up beers from different breweries I went to when I was in Europe. And I mean, I think it's, I think it's gone back and forth to Europe like three times. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's it was it, worth the buy. It's held up. Yeah. It's near and dear to you at this point. It's like, oh, exactly. It's, it's my beer exactly. luggage. We can't, we can't forget this yep. one. This is, it's awesome. Yep. Well, John, man, I, I appreciate yep. you taking the time and, and doing this. This is great. Again, can't wait to get down there, check out your spot, and and see what you're doing. Yeah, man. I've heard nothing but great things from from your brewery, and kudos to that. You know, keep it up, keep kicking ass, and I appreciate it, man. Well, I, I hope to stay in touch. Absolutely, stay in touch, brother, and uh, let's hook up on the that collab beer, man. I'll get to thinking here. I'll let you know how this Galaxy IPA turns out here, and maybe do a little uh, rendition off of that. <laughs> All right, man. We'll stay well, brother. Have All a good right. one. You too. See ya.